Now, what I want to do next is tell you how the French Revolution continued uh, for the next several years. And this is going to seem like political history, and much of it is, but it has a military point to it, as you're going to see toward the end of the uh, uh, of this presentation, this part of the presentation. Um, and I also want you to understand the vulnerability of, uh, of republics um, in general, because this particular republic lasted really only a, only a very few years and involved self-government by the people for only a very brief period of that, uh, of the, the period in which France was nominally a republic. The revolution now entered a second radical phase. First phase was moderate. Now we're dealing with a radical phase. And in seven, and it begins in seven in December 1792, when King Louis the Sixteenth, who had proven that he had no interest in becoming a constitutional monarch, was finally realized that there was nothing to do but get rid of him. He was going to be a constant threat otherwise. So he was placed on trial for treason. And in January 1793, was beheaded with the guillotine. His wife, the Austrian-born Queen Marie Antoinette, was executed a few months later. In 1793, the war that the French Republic had begun the previous year continued abroad, and a revolt of peasants in the Vendée, which is a province on the western coast of France, led to a situation in which it looked as if the Republic could not effectively control power. So a group called the Jacobins, which were the radicals, then replaced the Girondins, the uh, moderates, as the dominant group in the national convention, the national legislature. The Jacobins, and again, these are the radicals, wanted centralized as opposed to federalized or federal government. That is to say, you know, government by the national, you know, centralized national government as opposed to government that was spread out equally between the national government and the various uh, provincial uh, governments. So they wanted to have centralized as opposed to federal government. And they favored government controls on business to deal with the needs of the emergency. This won them su the support of the sans culotte. And on June 2nd, 1793, 80,000 sans culottes surrounded the convention and arrested the Girondins, the moderates. To cope with the supreme emergency facing the country, the Jacobins, the radicals, created a committee of public safety. Twelve men led by Maximilian Robespierre, he's in the upper left-hand corner, who for the next year ruled France with an iron hand. Robespierre, who's kind of first among, among equals among the twelve, believed in a concept of a general will advocated by the French philosopher and social critic Jean-Jacques Rousseau. He also believed he knew what the general will of France was. And he believed that the highest good required the death of anyone who opposed this general will as Robespierre understood it. Under his direction, the committee inaugurated what became known as the Reign of Terror, in which the Jacobins ruthlessly hunted down, tried, and executed anyone um, who seemed to threaten the Republic. About 40,000 people died during the Reign of Terror, and most of these were ordinary people, not the, not the nobility. There's an often a, a misconception that it's the nobility who suffered under the Reign of Terror, and not true, it was anybody. Um, mostly ordinary people who were deemed to be a threat to the Republic. Eventually, however, the Committee of Public Safety's rule was so exacting that it alienated virtually everyone, including the sans culotte, for when their leaders dared question Robespierre, he had them killed too. So his original supporters, you know, were now the targets. Uh, of his repression. And in, seven, and in July 1794, people had had enough. Robespierre, shown here on the scaffold, was tried and guillotined, and the terror ended. Rule passed back into the hands of the moderates, the middle class, 
Now, this became known as the Thermidorian reaction, and that's the way that it's gone into history as the Thermidorian reaction. It's, it's a fairly famous term, and it applies to it has been applied to other revolutions besides the French Revolution because people have noticed a pattern whereby revolutions sometimes go through a moderate phase and then a radical phase and then a reaction phase against the radical phase. And this, this reaction phase is called the Thermidorian reaction. But it comes from uh, Thermidor, which was one of the 10 new months into which the revolutionary government had divided the calendar. From then until 1799, the new moderate government continued to face both internal and external pressures. And during these years of trying to remain in the saddle, it was forced to turn increasingly to the army for support. Finally, in November 1799, a general named Napoleon Bonaparte, who much more later, seized power in a coup d'etat. And there are two areas of significance to this. The first is the way in which um, in many governments, around the world, um, civilian government, but particularly Republican governments, particularly democratic government, uh, falls into the hands of the military. Sometimes a, a direct military dictatorship, sometimes a dictatorship by someone who is nominally a civilian, but who can count on the backing of the army, the backing of naked force um, to underwrite uh, their leadership. That's the first thing, the first area of significance. The second area of significance is simply political, and it's something that um, um, I want you to, uh, uh, to understand for its own sake. Because initially, Napoleon was one of three consuls. The term was deliberately adopted from the ancient Roman Republic to create a veneer of continued Republican government. The other two consuls believed they could control him. Uh, they were wrong. Soon all real power lay in his hands. So you have that, but you also have an illustration of the vulnerability of republics in general and, democ and democracies in particular. And this is something that republics have faced throughout history. The history of, of republics generally is that they fail. Uh, republics and democracies have been failing uh, around the world now uh, for decades. Uh, there is a sense that authoritarian governments work better, they're more efficient, they can get things done in a way that democracies uh, cannot. Uh, there's frustration even in this country about the sort of the gridlock that characterizes our democracy and the way that, that things have devolved into uh, tribalism. And, um, uh, and so, you know, even in, even in the United States, you can see a trend in some areas toward people who, who favor uh, an authoritarian form of government. They don't think of it really that way. They think of it as a government that would get things done the way they want them to be done. But nevertheless, um, you know, we're dealing with a, uh, you know, a threat to democratic government, even here at home. And what I want you to, to, uh, to look at now is a, uh, about a four minute clip by a Harvard scholar who's an expert on how democracies die, has written or uh, co-written a very famous book uh, on the subject called literally How Democracies Die. And he explains this, uh, this process, and it's really worth understanding uh, for its own sake, so. My name is Daniel Ziblatt. I'm a professor of government at Harvard University. I've co-written a book with my co-author Steve Levitsky called How Democracies Die. Really three points from the book I think are really worth emphasizing. Uh, number one, the way democracies has died over time has changed. During the Cold War, most democracies died through military coups. Uh, since the end of the Cold War, the way that democracies die is through elections at the hands of elected leaders. Official po politicians get elected, come to office, and then once in office, dismantle democratic institutions. Number two, the question then becomes how do we prevent demagogues, 
people who have authoritarian inclinations from using democratic institutions to come to power and then dismantle them? How do we prevent them from coming to power in the first place? Historically, the way this has happened is through political parties and politicians, establishment politicians, having the political courage to draw a line in the sand and say, we will not cooperate with these demagogues. When politicians have failed to do this, whether in 1930s Germany, whether in 1990s Venezuela, whether 1920s Italy, in all of those instances, mainstream politicians see a demagogue on the horizon, and rather than drawing a line in the sand and saying, we will not, we will not cooperate with these figures, in each of those instances, mainstream politicians think they can tap into the popularity of these outside demagogues. And so in Italy, mainstream politicians embraced Mussolini. In Germany, mainstream politicians embraced Adolf Hitler. In the 1990s Venezuela, mainstream politicians embraced Hugo Chavez. In each instance, a kind of Faustian bargain was formed where political leaders thought they could tap into the popularity of these guys, but in every instance, these bargains backfired, and the outside demagogues came to power, posing an existential threat to democracies. The third big point is this. Once a demagogue is in office, what happens? The game has really changed. And Democracy is fundamentally challenged when you have authoritarians in power. In the United States, we tend to think that our checks and balances will constrain authoritarian demagogues. That's the way the, way the system was designed, to constrain the power of overreaching politicians. And in many ways, our checks and balances is an ingenious system that works quite well. But one thing we haven't really fully appreciated is that our checks and balances rely on a set of unwritten rules. Our Constitution is really a short document. And at the end of the day, our Constitution doesn't enforce itself. It requires political leaders committed to norms of mutual toleration, norms of self-restraint, uh, to protect the democracy. I mean, the Constitution only works when they behave in ways that have allowed our democracy to work over the last several hundred years. So as polarization uh, has come to American politics, as it has in other countries around the world, these norms have become frayed. Politicians increasingly view each other as existential threats. Rather than viewing each other simply as rivals, they view each other as enemies. And the degree to which we do that, and we see this around the world and as well as in the United States, democracy is much more fragile. So the task ahead that we conclude is to think about ways of repairing our political system, to treat each other no longer as enemies, as simply rivals with competing visions for politics. People need to fight hard for what they believe in, but people need to citizens as well as political leaders need to treat each other with respect. Um, we think the United States faces a set of challenges, but in many ways, there's, the United States is a very old democracy, a very rich democracy, and we really think that the U.S. can repair itself. But we, we face challenges that we've never faced before. The troubling feature of those who initially favor Republican government, small r Republican government, or Democratic uh, government, um, and by the way, Demo uh, Democratic government is sort of a broader form of Republican uh, government. Republican government basically uh, is government by uh, the people, the legitimate authority is, is held uh, by the people, not monarchs, but not all the people. Uh, and, it, and the number of people who, who actually can hold political power, can actually exercise the vote, can be comparatively narrow. This was tr true of the original vision of the founders. But in the United States, by the 1820s, uh, there was um, general, generally speaking, uh, all white males could vote. Uh, and you, this, this gives you the beginnings of what's been called Jacksonian democracy because it happened under President Andrew Jackson or the white man's democracy because it excluded African-Americans by and large, it excluded women um, until the early part of the, uh, the 20th century. And the thing is, democracy is a process. It is a way of getting things done. And if you're process oriented, then democracy is uh, significant and something that you want to keep. But I think that a lot of people historically, and perhaps in this, this country today are outcome driven. 
They want to have certain outcomes. And if they can't get the outcomes to a democratic process, they're willing to turn to authoritarianism uh, as a way of getting the outcomes that they wanted. And this is what happened in France. Napoleon ruled as first consul for the next five years. Nominally, France was still a republic. And increasingly, though, this was in name only. In December 1804, Napoleon made himself emperor, significantly emperor of the French, not of France, which is a nod to the theoretical sovereignty of the people. And he cast himself as the protector of the values of the revolution. And by and large, the people approved. What <coughs> life under a Republican form of government had proven too stormy and unstable, and they preferred the stability that Napoleon offered them. Machiavelli's warning about the fragility of republics proved shockingly true in the case of France. From its proclamation in 1792 until its formal end in 1804, the Republic lasted just 12 years. And for nearly all of those years, it was ruled by a handful of men. The Committee of Public Safety during the radical phase of the revolution, the Directory during the reaction phase, and ultimately by a single man, Napoleon himself.